Hallelujah. Come on and put your hands together with us. Thank you for joining us. Hallelujah. Hey.
has to be bound in the name of Jesus. I need somebody right where you're sitting, right where you're standing, right in your living room, right in your home to shout out the name of Jesus because he is great and greatly to be praised. Open up your mouth and say hallelujah, hallelujah. There's nobody stronger. There is nobody that can defend you like he can. There is nobody can heal you like he can. So I dare you right where you are to lift up your hand to celebrate the name of Jesus. This is somebody's testimony right where they're sitting right now. And I just need you to just touch yourself to believe and agree in what we're saying today. Oh, tell me who can stand me, because it can't be COVID, for us when we call on that grave.
children and your children and your children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations. Your family, your children and the children and the children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around. surrounding you right now. He is still for you. I said he is still for you. And I'm going to say it again. He is still for you. He is not against you. He is still fighting for you. He is still standing with you, before you. He is even going ahead before you. He is with you at all times because that is the God that we serve. That is the God that is inside of us. Father, we thank you for who you are and we seal everything we, we discard everything that is around us right now, and we seal everything with an amen. But you have to believe it in your heart, and you have to have faith in what the word is saying. Say the Lord, the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you, be gracious. the Lord you're believing in, if it's a job, if it's a child, 
give us a mate. Whatever that you are believing in, say amen. It is so, because it is so in heaven. Come on, I dare somebody to just go ahead and type that in right now, that it is so. It is so, amen. Amen, amen. sing that together.
God, we believe that it is so because you said it is so, God. You said we will have joy. You said we will be blessed and, and prosper. You said we will be the head and not the tail. You said we are above and not beneath, God. So right now, Father, we trust in you, God. We depend on you, God. We know that you are the Alpha and Omega, Father. You're the beginning and the end, Father. There is nothing that takes you by surprise, God. So we honor you today, God. We bless you, God, because we know, Father, with you, Father, we win. With you, Father, we have victory, Father. With you, there is no racial injustice. With you, Father, there is no pandemic. With you, there is no sickness. Father, with you, there is no sadness. With you, Father, there is no depression. With you, God, there is no lack. So right now, Father, we claim victory, Father. We claim victory, Father, over our circumstances. We claim victory, Father, over what we see. We claim victory over how we feel. We claim victory, Father, over what we hear, God. Because we know in the name of Jesus, we win. In the name of Jesus, we have hope. In the name of Jesus, we will not fail because of you, God. So for that, we give you honor. For that, we give you praise. For that, we give give you glory. For that we say you are everything to us. For that Father we give you honor that only you deserve Father. Hallelujah to your name Jesus. 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 We give you the highest praise and we say it is so. Amen. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. 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 Hello, beautiful people. Thank you guys for joining The Bridge online. My name's Belaine. I'm so excited that you guys decided to worship with us today. This worship is no none like no other. Please go ahead and share it with your friends and your family on your timeline so they can go ahead and join on this worship experience. And also, don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you, guys. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you. We honor you. We magnify you. Because you're the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. Before you there were none. After you there shall not be. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, your name is to be worshipped and your name is to be adored. I don't know where it is that you are watching from today, but I want you to let you know that the power of the living God is able to reach you at your very point of need. I don't know what it is that you are in need of today, so this is what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and type in whatever you need that God to do for you. I want you to go ahead and type it in the comment section. And when you type in that need, it's going to create a point of contact between me and you. And we're going to be able to agree with change. We're going to agree for deliverance. We're going to agree for open doors. We're going to agree for open windows. We're going to agree for the miraculous. We're going to agree for the supernatural. We're going to agree for things that eyes haven't seen, ears have not heard. We're going to touch and agree today because we believe that God is able to do exceedingly and to do abundantly above all that we can ask, think, or even imagine. Well, good afternoon, Bridge family. It's a privilege for us to be able to worship together one more time in spirit and in truth. If you have been blessed by what you have heard already, I want you to make sure that you are a sharer of this broadcast today because we want to be able to bless, we want to be able to impart something to somebody that is on your timeline so we have worship through our song we have worship through prayer and now is the opportunity to worship through our giving listen i want to continue to thank you for how it is that you have always partnered with this ministry i want you to know that when it is that you give to this ministry you are just enabling us to be able to do god's work not just within these four walls but also throughout this entire community listen on the screen right now you are going to see with the way in 
which that you can give. You will simply text the word give, G-I-V-E, to the number that you see on that screen, which is 407-805-1635. And then you'll be able to worship through your giving. And so we thank God, we thank God for you today. Well, we are in week two of our sermon series that we are starting throughout the month of March, throughout the month of August, excuse me, we are in our sermon series entitled Boss Moves, Boss Moves, week two. And I invite you to join me in 1 Kings chapter number three, which is where we are going to begin this afternoon. And today what I want to do is I'm going to try not to yell like I normally do. I want to really be able to give instruction. I really want to be able to give guidance. just want to give some clues and some pointers as to exactly what it is that we're going to need, things that are going to be necessary in order for us to be able to make boss moves for the rest of 2020. Join me in 1 Kings chapter number 3. First Kings chapter number three. We're only going to look at about six verses, verses five through number eleven. We're going to look at those in the morning. Then after that, I'll just be able to give you some talking points, some notes, and then you will be able to transition to your next online service. Amen. Amen. First Kings chapter number three. Where we find ourselves in First Kings chapter number three. We see that this is the narrative about the life of a man named Solomon. If you know anything about Solomon, you know that Solomon was the son of King David. And Solomon, he was the one who was next in line to take over the kingdom of Israel. But as Solomon was growing up, he didn't have a lot of smooth sailing in his life. For you will realize that when you look at the narrative of Solomon's life, you will see that Solomon had a lot of sibling rivalry. And Solomon had a lot of family issues. Being born to the house of David in and of itself, there was problematic because we all know that although David was a man who was after God's own heart, David was not devoid of character issues. And so here it is, Solomon as the one who has a rightful heir to the throne of the kingdom of Israel. And we see that throughout the narrative of Solomon's life, we see that it is that Solomon's ascension to the throne was not smooth sailing, for it was a very problematic when it was that Solomon had to try to take control of the throne. And we'll see that Solomon had a brother named Adonijah. And Adonijah, he was a very ambitious individual. And so what he did was he schemed and he, he connived his way into trying to get into position to, in order for him to be able to inherit the throne that was not rightfully his. And so the Bible says that these are the things that Solomon had to go through before it was that he had an opportunity to inherit the kingdom of God. So when it is that we find ourselves in 1 Kings chapter number 3, we see that Solomon now has an opportunity for him to have a conversation with God. And it's very interesting in this conversation that God is having with Solomon. Um, God sees the character that Solomon had displayed in his life so far. And at this point, Solomon is a very, very young man. And so God asks him a question right around verse number five. God looks at Solomon and God says to him, ask, and what shall I give you? As God appears to Solomon in a dream. Now this question, this question, this question is a very, very important question because, and, and, and this is point number one that you can write this in the chat. Point number one is that your life is a series of choices. Uh -huh. It was the pastor David S. Jacques who, who gave this equation. He said that, he said that choice plus choice equals your life. If you want your life to change, you have to be able to change your choices. And the beautiful thing about the God that we serve is God is not, God does not rule in the form of a dictator. 
Although he is all powerful, although he is all knowing, although he is all consuming, God does not rule with dictatorship as because God provides you the opportunity for you to choose. Choice plus choice equals your life. And so you have to understand that the sum of your life, it is bound by both sides of the equation, which is choice. Every single day that you wake up, you are going to have to choose how it is that you are going to live your life. And when it is that you are trying to live for God, those choices now become more paramount because every single decision that you make, it has destiny implications. Let me back up and say this. You can go ahead and put this in the chat, that there are three types of choices that every single person has to make on a daily. Number one, the first type of choice is the optional choices. Optional choices are just that. They are things that are optional. You can take them or you can leave them. But at the end of the day, you still have to make a decision about them. These are things that do not add or take away from your life. You can just take them or leave them or not. They are simply optional. Then you have preferential choices. These are choices that are affected by your preferences. Now, the thing about a preferential choice is the thing that you are deciding upon, these are things that are essential for your life. But the method or the process by which that you decide on that thing, it's up to your preferences. Uh -huh. For example, um, praise and worship is something that is necessary in the life of a believer. But how it is that you choose to worship your God, that is left up to your preferences. Uh -huh. So we have optional choices, we have preferential choices, but then we also have fundamental choices. These are things that are fundamental fundamental to the life of a believer. These are not things that you can skirt around. These are not things that you can avoid. These are not things that you can kick the can down for later. No, these are things that you have to make a decision about now. And oftentimes it is not really left up to your preferences about how about these decisions. These are things that you have to consult God with. Uh-huh. Solomon now, in his dream, God, the Lord appears to him, and the Lord asks him a question. He says, Solomon, what shall I give you? And, and I love Solomon's answer that you find in verse number 9. Solomon begins, it begins his conversation with God in verse number 8. Solomon says, your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered and counted. Um, then Solomon says in verse number 9, Therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? And so when Solomon says this in verse number 9, we see that Solomon's asked that God can give him a discerning heart. And in other translations, they'll say that Solomon asks for wisdom. Uh-huh. And so when God was asking Solomon, I'm ready and willing and able to give you anything, the Bible says that the thing that Solomon chose to ask for is wisdom. This what makes sense why Solomon wrote in the book of Proverbs that, that, that wisdom is the principal thing. It is the foundational thing. And, that, now, and I love how the Lord continued this conversation with Solomon and he says these things. He says, Solomon, I'm going to grant it to you, but watch, watch what the Lord says. The Lord says this in verse number 11. He says, because you have asked for this thing, which is wisdom, and have not asked for long life for yourself, nor have you asked for riches or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies, but you have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. And so the Lord looked at Solomon's request and God said specifically, he said, Solomon, you did not ask for long life, you did not ask for wealth, and you did not ask for the death of your enemies. And because of that, because you did not ask for these things, the God says to Solomon, I am going to grant you not only what you have asked for, but I'm going to give you riches and honor above and beyond what you did. Now, so God says, Solomon, you did not ask for long life, you did not ask for wealth, and you did not ask for death. 
Now, when I look at these things and I'm asking myself, why is it that God chose these things specifically? See, number one is that when we talk about asking for long life, when we talk about asking for long life, we think that we, oftentimes we think that it's referring to the length of our life, right? And, but it's not just bound to the length of your life. Long life now is also talking about the depth of your life. Uh -huh. You see, it's one thing for, 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 for us to live long, then it's another thing for us to live deep. And I'm asking myself a question. Why is it that God was glad that Solomon did not ask for this? But then the second thing that God mentioned is that Solomon, you did not ask for wealth. Uh -huh. So you have to understand that sometimes when we are asking that God can make us rich or wealthy, the problem with that is sometimes our motives behind that request is carnal. Uh -huh. If the request that we were asking for was rooted in our desire to be able to bless other individuals, that request would then, see, would, would then be noble. But the problem is too often times when we are asking that God can bless us financially, it's so that we are able to stunt on our haters. And see, the problem is that man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. And so whenever God sees what your intent is, and that intent is not fueled by a motive, that comes from his spirit then God will instead of God granting that request God will judge that request so God said Solomon I'm so glad that you did not ask for wealth and then God says Solomon I'm glad that you did not ask for the life of your enemies or I'm glad that you did not ask for revenge and this is the thing that we have to understand that re about, about revenge revenge is an extension of insecurity in the natural and revenge is an extension of unbelief in the spiritual. So whenever it is that an individual now is fueled or filled by revenge, it is a twofold problem. Number one, it is, an, it is an extension of your insecurity. Because whenever it is that you want to go out and seek revenge, what you are then saying is, I do not think that I am capable to rise above what that person did to me. So instead of me rising above what they did to me, I want to pull that individual back down. And so what it, lets, what it should tell you is that you are insecure in your ability to get ahead because of what they did to them. The devil is a liar. It doesn't matter what anybody says about you. It doesn't matter what anybody does to you. It doesn't matter what anybody would wish would happen to you. If God before you, who can be against you? If God before you, who can be against you? Do not allow, do not allow revenge to feel your heart because it exposes your insecurity in the natural but then in the spiritual what it does is that revenge exposes your unbelief because what you are then saying to God is saying God I do not believe that you have the power to repay my enemies for what they did to me and because you are then saying God I don't believe that you have the power to repay my enemies for what they did to me what then what you are then saying to God is God I believe that your powers are limited and so what revenge does is it exposes your unbelief in God being able to do what he said that he will do and so when God told Solomon Solomon I'm glad that you did not ask for long life I'm glad you did not ask for wealth and I'm glad that you did not ask for revenge the reason God said that he was glad Solomon did not ask for those things was because those things are things that God had already promised to his children. Uh -huh. You have to understand that in Psalm 91 verse 6, the Bible says that with long life, he will satisfy us. And so, and so in not asking for it, we are simply acknowledging one of the promises of God. Then you also have to understand that in Proverbs chapter 13 and 22, it says that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. So in not asking for wealth, we are simply then acknowledging the fact that wealth now now is something that God has already promised to his children and then in us not asking God for revenge on our enemies we are simply acknowledging the fact that the Bible says that vengeance is mine says the Lord and so God has already made these promises to us and so the problem is that wisdom would have us to pray for things that God has not specifically promised see the problem is because we do not know God's promises 
we spend too much of our days asking for things that's already been written. You see, you have to understand that God is an answerer of prayers. So when it is that you address a prayer to God, you are then asking God for what it is that you want. And the reason why wisdom is a principal thing was, is because that wisdom will have you to pray the correct prayers. Uh -huh. In the book of James, chapter number 4, verse 13, James says that oftentimes we pray amiss. That means that oftentimes we go to God with requests that God has already granted. Oh, my God. And so the reason why we are asking God to do something that he said he's already going to do is because we have not seen the manifestation of what God said he's going to do. And you have to understand that God is not bound by your timeline. God is not restricted to your time frame. So just because he hasn't done it in the time that you want him to do does not mean that God is not going to do it. And there are too many Christians who spend so much time praying amiss. You have to understand that once you address it, once the God, he heard you the first time, it is now time for you to begin to shift your prayer life and for you to begin saying, God, I know I asked for it. Now ask that, teach me, God, how to live in it. See, the problem is we are always asking God to help us lose weight instead of us asking God to help teach us how to eat properly. Uh -huh. You see, the problem is we do not want God to teach us how to eat properly because we enjoy that process. But the thing is, we, do, we just want God to fix the end result. But God is not simply a destination God. He's also a journey God. He's concerned with how you are getting to where you are getting to. And anytime you are getting to where you are getting to outside of his will, he is not bound to fix the end result. But when it is that you are in his process, God has no choice but to allow allow you to walk it out properly so if you say God help me in the process then you can apply the fact that every step of a righteous man is ordered by the Lord listen I'm going to give you these three things and I'm going to have you out of here so that you can continue on with your Sunday three reasons why we have to have the spirit of Solomon and pray for wisdom. You would think that this was something that is easy to understand. But it's been difficult in application. And I'm going to give you the three things that hinder us from asking God for wisdom. Very practical. I want you to make sure that you write this down. Put this in the chat. Number one, is that we do not pray for wisdom because of fear. I need three people to go ahead and put that in the chat. Because of fear. Uh-huh. Because sometimes we would rather live in ignorance than be privy to the information that we know is made available to us. Oftentimes, the reason we would rather live with not knowing uh, is because we realize that once we get that information, we now have to change our life. And I don't know who this is for. There is somebody who is listening today that you, you, you are scared to pray to God to ask him to show you that thing. Because you know that once God shows you that thing, you now have to change your life based on that word that God gave you. This is why the Bible says that the word of God shall not return unto him void, but it shall accomplish all things that it's set for. It is not just bound by scripture, it's bound by the word that God gives. So whenever it is that God answers your prayer with, with a word of wisdom now, whatever God tells you, it has to accomplish it. But what happens is because we are oftentimes fearful 
of the unknown. We have a tendency to shy away from asking God's wisdom. We simply, instead of us praying about the issue, we pray around the issue. Watch this. Because oftentimes we have gotten so accustomed to living with the issue that we say, God, I'm, I'm okay with a little bit of it. But just give me the things that I feel that are too much for me to bear. You see, and this is the problem why we have to give everything to God and surrender all things. You see, we have gotten to the place we say, God, I'm comfortable with my bad marriage because I've gotten, I've gotten accustomed to living in it. But God wants you to surrender all of that marriage to him. Don't try to do anything on your own because you need his wisdom in order to have that next conversation, that, that next difficult conversation. You need the wisdom of God in order for the right results to come from that conversation. This is why the scripture says, he has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Uh, all right. Let me say this before, before I move on to my next point. So that when it is that you pray for wisdom and God gives you his wisdom, every action that you do with that wisdom, it has to be laced with love, power, and a sound mind. So this is why when it is that you are going to make boss moves based on God's wisdom, it can't be done out of emotionalism. Because your emotions will not allow you to think properly. Your emotions will not allow you to see clearly. Your emotions will not allow you to discern correctly. It has to be done with a sound mind. And it also has to be done with power. Meaning that once it is you say what God told you to say, you have to not, you have to stand on that word. Because oftentimes when we release what God tells us to say, we are then looking for other people to affirm what God told us. Because, and until somebody else affirms it, we are shaky on what God said. But it if in order for you to truly experience the power that comes from God's word, you have to believe it first. Even if nobody else is with you, this is the reason why you have to understand that you plus God is the majority. If you do not want to come with me, that's okay. I have the spirit of Peter with me. If you want to stay in the boat, that's all right because I heard him say come. And as long as he said come, that's enough for me for me to step out on my boat. You have to understand that nothing is going to change if you are still waiting for other disciples to agree with you because they don't see what you see so fear hinders us from seeking wisdom number two is perspective All right. go ahead and put this in the chat preconceived perspective have you ever had a conversation with somebody and they disagree with you about a theological issue? And then the first thing that they say is, where does it say that in the Bible? And then oftentimes, you can show them book, chapter, and verse. And then they'll ask you another question about that same thing. The reason why people are so reluctant to unlearn something that was destructive to them in the first place is because we oftentimes come into issues with preconceived perspectives. Anytime you have a preconceived perspective, that gen shapes the narrative of how you're going to see everything that comes after it. This is the reason why. When it is that you are asking God for wisdom, you cannot allow your preconceived perspectives to contaminate what God is going to tell you. Because if you allow that thing to mix with your preconceived perspective, it will taint the word of God. This is the reason why you can meet somebody that is God sent. But because of your preconceived perspective, how all men are dogs, you will oftentimes reject 
reject the next person that God sends into your life. This is the reason why God can send the mentor that you have been asking for. But because another man hurt you because your father was never there for you, you do not trust any pastor. And that pastor can have the key that you need for your future. That pastor can have the word that you need for your next season. But because you don't trust any man, because you don't trust any male, because of your preconceived perspective of how that all pastors want is your money, how all the church is after is your money, because of your preconceived perspective, you will miss out on what God has for you. This is what I need you to understand, that in order for me to go to make boss moves in this next season, I need to leave everything that I thought I knew. I need to, I need to discard everything that I thought I wanted. And God, when I'm asking for your wisdom, God, allow me to receive it with a clean slate, God. Do not allow my preconceived notion to get mixed into that thing because then I'm going to see what you told me through my lens of disappointment. I'm going to see it through the lens of hurt. I'm going to see it through the lens of frustration. I'm going to see it through the lens of giving up. This is the reason and why a lot of us want to give up on our marriage because we have this preconceived notion that if I'm not happy, I'm out. Not realizing that maybe God is using this difficult situation not to, not to make him better, but to shape your character. And as soon as your character is shaped, then God will fix that thing that you are asking for. But do not allow your preconceived perspective to taint what he's telling you. Because listen, listen, every single thing that you went through, it might have been painful, painful, and God may not have sent it, but it does not mean that God can't use it. And so we have to give God access to the hidden chambers of our mind, to the hidden chambers of our heart and said, God, I know I've labeled the container that these memories are in and I've labeled them bad, but God, I'm asking that you can redefine how I see it because once you redefine it, God, then I would, then that allows me to give you access to use it. This is the reason why Romans 8 and 28 says that all things work together. For the good of those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. So fear is an issue. Preconceived perspective is an issue. And this is the last one. Make sure you put this in the chat. Responsibility. <laughs> and I'm finished here. Once it is that God gives you wisdom, every single time that God gives you a new nugget of wisdom, God has given you another load of responsibility. So make sure that if you're saying, God, I want to make boss moves, you have to understand that boss moves do not just allow you to live better, but allows you to have a new load of responsibility. Uh -huh. Whenever God gives anybody a nugget of wisdom, what God is saying is, I'm giving you the ability to see further than the group of people that's connected to you. And because you can see further, you have a responsibility to shape where the people who's connected to you are going. And because you have that responsibility, you then cannot live any type of way that you want. You then cannot speak any type of way that you want because that responsibility now is not simply to you living better. It's also connected to your community. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that when it is that God gives an individual wisdom, what God is saying is I need you to be a shaper of the future for the community that I have given you access to. How difficult is it for me to be a father and I realize that every decision that I make, it not only affects me, but it affects my entire family. How difficult it must be to be a mother to realize that thing that I told my daughter when she's six years old, when she is 26, she's still going to be replaying that same thing in her mind. And the reason why you know that this is true 
because, because you remember when you were six and somebody said something to you not realizing the responsibility that they had to store and shape your mind and your heart. So when it is that we are asking God for wisdom, we are saying, God, I think that I am ready to handle the weight of the community that you have allowed to be connected to me. And so, we shy away. But this is what I need us to understand. We get real practical here. If God put it in your heart to pray about it, that's because God has given you the skills to do it. I think I need to say that one more time. Somebody needs to take that. Put this in your notes. If God has put it in your heart to pray about it, God has given you the skills to do it. So the gap between prayer and execution, that gap is called responsibility. And listen, it may seem scary when you look into the eyes of your children and they're looking to you for answers and they don't realize that, that you just spent the past three hours crying because you don't even know what the next move is. It may seem difficult when people look at you as a leader, not realize the fragile condition of your heart. It may seem difficult when your wife looks at you as a husband and she sees you as a king but in your mind you feel like a peasant because you're not where you want to be in life. It may seem difficult that the responsibility is insurmountable, but I want you to let you know that it was intentional that God wants you to feel like the responsibility is insurmountable because with man it might be impossible, but with God nothing is impossible. And as long as I have the wisdom that God gives, I'll be able to brave anything that comes into my life because I will not fear anymore. I will not have any preconceived perspectives and I will embrace the responsibility that wisdom gives. Listen, I want to pray for you because there's somebody who's watching us today who has to go to work tomorrow and you're afraid of facing what's going to be waiting for you. There's somebody who's driving in their car right now. And you're about to pull into your driveway. And you're thinking that you should go sit in another parking lot for another hour and a half. Because you're scared of the responsibility that's in that household waiting for you. There's somebody who's watching right now. And you're saying, God, I know what I need to do. But Father, I'm scared to do it. And I want you to understand that God has the wisdom that you need in order for you to brave that situation. We oftentimes say this, and I'll finish right here, that he will never put more on you than you can bear. I want you to put this in the chat. That's a lie. There is no scripture that says that God won't put more on you than you can bear. As a matter of fact, God is looking for individuals to overload with burdens. But the ones he's going to overload is the ones that he can trust that will go to him in prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God. So my brothers and my sisters, we need to be like Solomon. Solomon said, God, give me wisdom, a discerning heart. And this is why Solomon said he needed. Solomon said, I need wisdom so that I can lead your people that are unnumberable. And so the reason why you need wisdom is so that you can lead the life that God has called you to lead because of what he has trusted you with, what he has instilled inside of you 
is innumerable. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we honor you today. We magnify you. We give you praise, honor, and the glory that only you are worthy of. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, your name is to be worshipped. Father God, there is somebody today, Lord, who needs you, God who needs to hear from you, who needs your guidance, who needs your direction, who needs you to point them in the right direction, Father, because they realize that they cannot go another day without you leading. And so, Heavenly Father, we touch and we agree today, God, that you can intercede for them, Father, that wherever it is that they are listening today, God, that you can go and let them understand that you know the route, that you know the way, you know the direction, Father. Lord, I'm praying that you can be a road map for them, Father, that they will not lean on their own understanding, God, but in all their ways, they will acknowledge you, God. And so that just like Solomon, when he had the opportunity to choose, he chose wisdom. Father God, allow us to be wise in our decision making. Allow us to have relational wisdom emotional wisdom so that what it is that you are calling us to do and to lead we'll be able to do it for the glory of God so that next time somebody asks how were we able to make it out we'll say it's not because of anything that we knew but it was the wisdom that comes only from the king of kings and the lord of lords we trust you we depend upon you we pray today in the mighty and the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.